when a lady raised her hand and said, uh, Mr. Farr, Brother Farr, would, I have a question for you. Should I forgive my cousin for molesting my grandson? Do I have to forgive him? I want to look real quickly at the, the verse we've been using. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. I want you to realize this is something you have an invitation from Jesus to follow him. And it's a journey. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess it up in your eyes. But God does not let your mistakes go uh, without giving you something in return. And a lot of times what we think is a mistake is not a mistake. Okay? So, here's what I want you to realize. It is a process. When you're following Jesus, you don't just automatically become like Jesus. It takes time. And then I really want to emphasize, I want to emphasize, I will make you. Underline those words, and I know I've had you do this before, but you need to understand that God is going to do something in you. He will transform you. A lot of people, that's part of the reason why I brought Monty up here today, is because a lot of people think, I can't do that. Neil's a trained professional. I was not trained to do this. This is something I've learned to do over the years. Um, and you can too. Now, we've been going through this series, and today's class is going to be difficult. Because we're going to talk about the lies you believe. I was... Uh, at dinner with Peter and Terry this past week, and we were, we were joking around and stuff, and I forget what I said, but everybody at the table knew it wasn't true. And uh, Terry started pointing out to me, doesn't the Bible say something about lying? And I just looked at her and I said, well, if I know it's a lie and you know it's a lie, is it really lying? And, and we were just kind of having a good time about that. Do you realize who you believe the most, the, the lies you believe the most? Who tells you the lies that you believe the most? Do you know who that is? Yourself. Exactly. We lie to ourselves all the time, don't we? We intend to do something that we never do. How many of you have said, I'm getting in shape? And you're still in the same shape you were in before. How many of you have said, I'm going on a diet, I'm not eating that anymore? And four hours later, you're eating that again. We lie to ourselves more than anybody else. Now, as you're dealing with people, and this, this section we're going to do today is for those of you who are in discipleship relationships. It's good for yourself, but it's also good for you if, as you're dealing with people. People lie to themselves all the time, and they believe those lies. Now, if you've got your uh, notes in front of, front of you, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 5, a truthful witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. Sometimes we're a false witness to ourselves. John chapter 8, verses 44 through 45, and J Jesus is saying to people, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. Underline those words, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Now, underline verse 45, yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. When the Bible says, God will forgive you of your sins, and you go on to say, I don't feel forgiven, you're telling yourself a lie. And underline verse 45, because Jesus says, Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. 
This is very important to this class today that we're talking about because you're going to deal with broken people. You have to deal with your own brokenness first, but you've got to learn to deal with broken people. I have yet to meet a person that is not broken in some way. I, I, I meet people all the time, and, and everybody thinks, oh, well, that person's got it all together. Let me just tell you the truth about people. There's not a single person in this room that has it all together. No one has it all together. Everybody in here is dealing with something. Now, I will say this. <laughs> Some of us are better at hiding what our brokenness is. But that doesn't mean we're not all broken. Some of us come in here on Sunday morning and we know when to stand up and we know when to sit down. We know when to sing and when to close our eyes and when to partake of communion. But we're not even here because of our brokenness. And I'm telling you this because, first of all, you've got to deal with your own brokenness, and we all have it. But secondly, we have to learn to deal with other people's brokenness. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Underline those words. Be self-controlled and alert. Because this is a battle within you, whether you believe it or not. It says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I have seen that over and over this week. This has not happened in the last month. This has happened this past week where I have watched Satan try to devour people I mean, almost every day. And a lot of it has to do with what they believe about themselves. And, and, and it's, it's, it's from teenagers to young adults to even senior citizens that I have watched the devil come in and try to devour them. So, we know Satan is the father of lies. When he speaks, you know it's a lie. Have y'all ever met anybody that would rather lie than tell the truth? I've seen it. And, I, and, you know, and when I'm with these people, I'm just, I, it's constant battle for me. Is there any truth to what they're saying? And, and so we have that with the devil. He, when he speaks, he speaks his native language. Now, in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 5, we see how this all began with this with the devil and how he lies it says now the serpent was more crafty than any other of the wild animals the lord god had made and he said to the woman did god really say you must not eat of the tree in the garden now underline those words did god really say because a lot of us don't really believe god in what, what he says god does not lie God's promises are true. He is faithful in his promises. But the very first thing that Satan wants to do to us is he wants us to start believing that lie. Did God really say? And, and, and he said in, in verse 2, it says, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Verse 4, you will not surely die. Underline those words, there's a lie. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of, eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Since the beginning of time, Satan has tried to get us to believe his lies. And most of the lies he's trying to get us to believe are, are about ourselves. And the problem is, Adam and Eve did, were not equipped to handle Satan's lives. And most of us are not equipped to handle Satan's lives. Because Eve knew what God wanted. Everybody agree with that? She knew what the truth was. But she didn't listen to the truth and she didn't have a way to combat what Satan was doing to her. A lot of us today have the same issues that Eve has. We may know the truth, but we have not let the truth set us free. Yes, Nancy.
go back to the beginning and read chapters 1 and 2, um, Eve and Adam referred to God as the Lord God until this verse, chapter, and, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, where Satan said, did God. He is not the Lord to Satan, and Satan changed how he referred to him, and the very next verse, Eve did too. Do you, do you, did, did you hear that in the back? Could y'all hear that in the back? Good. All right. If you could hear it in the back, you could probably hear it online. But basically, Nancy's saying is, is uh, Satan came along and changed the language. And we're getting ready to do a series on Daniel, and you're going to talk about changing languages and changing things, how Satan uses that to change who we are. It, it's a constant reminder from the time of Genesis that if we can change words, we can change people. And it, we see it over and over again. So, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, I put it in your notes, but that's the temptation of Jesus. Most of y'all remember the temptation of Jesus. And I want to ask you a question. When Jesus was tempted, how did he handle that? You guys know your Bible. He quoted the Bible. And the reason why I want you to hear that, and the reason why I want to talk about that a little bit today, is because we all believe some kind of lie about ourselves. I was listening to the radio some time ago, and there was a lady uh, that was talking to a Christian counselor. This guy was, was uh, talking about depression, and he was talking about... I, I listen to Moody Radio a lot while I drive. I... I enjoy the, the, the sermons and things like that. You do too? Okay, so, so if I have an illustration and you heard it on Moody Radio, you know where I got it from, okay? Uh, but in this, in, in this session, this guy was talking, there were people who were calling in. And that's fascinating to me because the, if, if there's anything that scares me is being unprepared for a question. I'll tell you, it happened to me when I did my very first meeting it was a week-long meeting I did in ten in Kentucky and they asked me to teach a ladies class and I'm like I have never taught a ladies class before and I went to Nancy and said what do ladies want to learn about she said sin and so anyway we I was in the ladies class and I had a, a whole series of lessons that I'd planned out for four days and I started my class and I was getting into it. I was doing the introduction, and I had all of these notes prepared, and I was ready for an hour class every single day. And I didn't get 15 minutes into the class when a lady raised her hand and said, uh, Mr. Farr, Brother Farr, would, I have a question for you. Should I forgive my cousin for molesting my grandson? Do I have to forgive him? And that was the end of my notes. <laughs> we never got back to my notes, never got back to that class. I had to drop back and punt and do a week's worth of classes on forgiveness because there was some real hurt that was going on in that little church because everybody was related in some way and everybody knew the situation. So I say that because... I like listening to other people be in those positions and see how they handle it. So this guy is on there and he's doing his best to talk about depression, talking about the scriptures and things like that. And this poor woman calls in and I mean, she sounded so pitiful. She talked about how she was abused when she was a child. She talked about how um, her parents told her that she was worthless and how her grandmother wouldn't have anything to do with her when she was little, and that she was disfigured, and, and all of these things, and that, that men have come into her life and had abused her. And, and it was one of the most challenging stories I have ever heard. She was the female version of Job. And she says, how can I believe? How can I believe that I have value after God allowed these things to happen to me. And I got to tell you, my heart was touched for this woman as I was listening to her because I thought, here is somebody that is so broken 
that she doesn't even feel like she has any hope whatsoever. And she had tried to commit suicide on two or three occasions, and she was trying to follow the Lord the best she could. She was a new Christian. And I'm listening, and I'm thinking, what is this guy going to say to her? Because it seemed like, from what she's saying, this is a hopeless situation. There's no way that he's going to come up with an answer that's going to fix this, and especially in the five minutes he's got to answer her, because they've got to go to commercial break. How is he going to do this? And he says, you need a Christian counselor. But what you need more than a Christian counselor is you need God's Word. And he started citing passages of scriptures that she needed to read every single day in order for her to have worth. Because what she is, was allowing to happen was all the neuro-linguistic programming she had in her life, that's self-talk, she allowed that to override the Word of God. And so he said, you need the Word of God to override your self-talk. Amazing. And from that day on, I decided that whenever I start to believe lies about myself, I'm going to get in the Word, and I'm going to find the answer in the Word. And if I can't find the answer, because sometimes we get blocked, don't we? We get to think in one way, and we can't think any other way, so we get blocked. And if I can't find that answer, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to somebody who can help me find that answer. And guess what that is? Discipleship. Where people are discipling me and I'm discipling them. Now I'm telling you all this because this, what we're talking about today, has to do with how we deal with ourselves and how we deal with the people of the world and how we deal with each other. Discipleship's not about just evangelizing, that's part of it. Discipleship is about building relationships so that we can help each other become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. You don't become a passionate follower of Jesus Christ by listening to gourmet classes like this. You become a passionate follower of Jesus Christ by walking hand in hand with somebody else who is a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. That's how you do it. You can't do it by yourself. If you try to do it by yourself, guess what happens? You get stuck because you only know so much, you've only experienced so much, and you don't have anybody to help you take those next steps and move to the next level, if you will. Questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, or just flat out want to talk before I move on. Anybody? I must be doing a great job because even Paul Matches doesn't want to say anything. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over some of these lies. And the first lie that I wanted to go over is the lie that most... Well, let me back up for just a minute. We'll just leave that on the screen right there. The other day I was talking with uh, Bryce, Bryce Reed. Uh, Bryce Reed and I are uh, working together quite a bit. We're spending some time together. And we were talking about having relationships and building relationships. And he asked me, he says, why do you think that it's harder for some people to have relationships with others than it is for most people and I told him I said if you really want to have deep relationships with people you have to be vulnerable and he goes what does that mean that seems that means you have to let people in and you have to let them know what your fears are you have to let people see what you struggle with and it was the funniest thing ever because he's sitting next to me in the truck and he goes oh no <laughs> And that was his honest reaction. And most of us in the room here, when it comes to being vulnerable, we won't go, oh, no. But we're going to be guarded. I'm guarded. And, and why, why are we guarded? The reason why we're guarded is because we've been hurt before, right? We don't want to be judged, do we? All right. The only people that I'm very vulnerable with are the ones that I'm really, really close to. And the ones that I'm really close to, I'm very vulnerable with. And the reason why I can be vulnerable with them is because I know they're not going to judge me. 
So, so let's just look, look at this. The first lie has to do with that. I can't trust others. Close relationships are unsafe. How many of y'all have ever thought that? You can raise your hand if you want. That's, that's kind of where, I mean, if you haven't had these lies, you will have them at some point in your life. And, and you've got to go back to the scriptures. Now look at this, what it says. A man of many companions may come to ruin. But there is, now underline these words, there is a friend. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There is a friend that sticks closer to the, than a brother. I am so fortunate because I have some really close friends. And I have, I, I got to tell you, I, this season of my life in preaching is probably the best one ever because of our eldership. Because I've got, I got Shaq, I got Chris, I got Gary. I, I cannot tell you how much I love Gary. Uh, because Gary just keeps a smile on my face constantly. And I've got David Love, and, and I got Bill Hemphill. Bill was just absolutely phenomenal this past week when I was uh, having lunch with him. I, I went in there, and I was just, I felt like I was gut punched when, we, when I sat down with him. And by the time I got through having lunch with him, and by the way, he bought me lunch too. <laughs> but by the time I got through having lunch with him, I was motivated and rejuvenated. I've got more than a friend. I have several friends. But there is always going to be at least one person in your life that you can be totally vulnerable with. And the extent that you're able to be vulnerable and them not judge you is to the extent that you're going to have those relationships. Remember we started off this class with those three questions that everybody's asking about us when they meet us. Number one, Todd, I'm gonna use Todd because Todd doesn't ever say anything so he doesn't talk back. But Todd, when I first met Todd, Todd wanted to know in his mind, does he like me? And Todd, I assumed you figured out I did. And then the second thing Todd wanted to know, and, and this has been very difficult for Todd because Todd comes from a very different background than what we have right here. And Todd wanted to know, could he trust me? You know, when you have people coming from different walks of life, that's a very hard thing because you don't really know, can I trust this person because they're not like me. And the third thing Todd wanted to know is, can he help me? And so that's where we are in our relationships. And when you get to that point in your relationships, then you have that friend that's closer than a brother. So what I did on your notes, and if you're watching online and you want this, uh, email the church office or email me if you have my email address, and I will send you a copy of all this. Now, let, let's look at the next slide on here, number two. If I'm not in control of the situation, something bad will happen. I'm raising my hand first. <laughs> Anybody else want to come along beside me? <laughs> it, all right, good, good. I'm not alone. But I really feel like I have to be in control of the situation. The most difficult thing for me to do, I, I'm an entrepreneur. That's, that's my bend. I want to be independent, and I want to be in charge. The hardest thing in the world for me to do is to let go. And, and how, how do we do that? We have to let go and let God, right? All right, so anybody got a scripture with that right off the top of their head? Be still and know that I'm God. That is a good one right there. There are dozens of scriptures about God letting God be in control. We can go through all of those. But I wanted to go through the, the lies. And what I want you to do is as we're going through these lies, I want you to star the ones. I, pick five. Five stars beside the ones that you think you struggle with the most. Okay? And these are all lies that we believe that we tell ourselves. Number three. 
I will fail no matter how hard I try, I will never be successful. Anybody ever believe that? Okay, good, good. We got, we got a few people of that. Uh, here's number four. And you, you may be asking, Neil, how did you come up with these lies? Well, most of them I've lived. Most of them I've lived. Number four, whatever I do, I won't be good enough. I hear this all the time. I can't be good enough. Uh, number five, <laughs> nobody's going to admit this one, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> I am superior to others. You would never raise your hand to that, would you? Let me just raise it for you. All right, everybody raise your hand right now. Just all of you raise your hand because at least one point in your life you've been driving down the road and you went, look at that idiot. Okay? You've all done it. You don't want to admit it, but we're in church and we don't want to lie. We all feel like we're superior in some way. We would never come out and say, I'm superior, but we act that way, right? Okay. Number six. I'm a victim Bad things always happen to me. And I, I got to tell you, there's a lot of people in the church that deal with this. Uh, Bryce and I, Bryce doesn't realize this, but Bryce is getting paid to work with me, but I'm discipling him. <laughs> I've never paid anybody so that I could disciple them, but hey, there's a first for everything. Actually, I have, but we won't go into that. But, but the point being is, is I'm talking to Bryce the other day and we were talking about being victims. And I said, you know, I know people that have had a hard life and they've been able to come out of it. And I've known other people who've had a very similar experiences and they've not been able to come out of it. And it all comes down to being a victim. And he says, yeah, we've got a lot of victims in the world today. And I said, yes, we have victims. We have people that are in their 40s and 50s that are still playing the victim card. It's time to grow up. It's time to let go of the past. It's time to move forward that God has given us a new life. Yes, ma'am. I can't remember the exact scripture, but it came to me that God will turn it out good for me. That God will do what? Will turn it out. Will turn out good. What's that scripture? That's that's a good one. God are you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good? Talking about Joseph, and then all things work for good for those that love the Lord. Amen? Amen. So these are scriptures, and you're, you're coming up with them right off the top of your head. And that's what we want to do, because when Satan tells us a lie, like he told Jesus a lie, what did Jesus do? He said, it is written. Now, I am going to tell you, you don't have to say it is written. God already knows that, but you can tell, God, you can tell yourself the scripture. If you want to, if you, if you want to get over your lies. Uh, how about this one, number seven? I am a bad person. There are so many Christians that are out there today, out here today, and they're struggling with sin. They're struggling with making the same mistakes over and over again. And they just come right out and tell me, I am a bad person. Had somebody tell me just the other day, I can't overcome. It's just the way I am. Number eight, I'm worthless. I don't have any value. And a lot of that that I've seen over the years of people that are struggling with their self-worth has to do with the way they perceive themselves as a child. Some of it has to do with mistakes they've made as an adult, but most of it has to do with the way they perceive themselves as a child. Number nine, people don't listen to me. I don't have anything of value to say. Have you ever said nobody listens to me? <laughs> nobody, nobody here. Or oh, I had a suggestion, but nobody heard it. Or I had a suggestion. My favorite one is Tyler 
works for a company and he had suggestions. He came up with this plan to help the company and do all these things. And uh, they said, well, we, you know, that was nice, but we're not gonna do any of that. He went away to captain's course for three months, came back and all of it was implemented like it was their idea. <laughs> Makes you feel like nobody ever listens to me. Number 10, I can't cope without, and we've got chemicals or drugs, food, spending, sex, gambling, shopping, the list goes on and on. I can't cope without watching TV. Ooh, hitting close to home. By the way, if you want to fast, try fasting from TV for one week. No TV, no news for one week. It'll change your life. Um, number 11, I have value when I'm needed and or noticed. You ever seen anybody that is kind of an attention junkie? They gotta be noticed. Some of y'all are looking at me saying, yeah, we, we see it right up here. <laughs> you gotta be noticed. Uh, I, I loved it when, and, and I, I don't see myself as having value because I'm needed or noticed, but I, I do feel like I, I am supposed to be a light to the world. And so I wanna be that light and I want to tell people their value when I meet them. And, and the funny thing about that is when the kids were little, I think Matthew was probably about 15, so that would have made Tyler about 12. Matthew got in the car one day and we were getting ready to go out to eat dinner. And uh, I said, where y'all wanna go tonight? And Matthew's words were, can we go someplace where you don't know anybody, Dad? <laughs> And I said, we could, but as soon as I got there, I'd know somebody. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. But there's some people that just have to have, they, they find their value in being needed or noticed. And, and number 12, man, this is really significant in the teenage years. I don't fit in. I don't fit in. And for people... Living in this world, teens especially, uh, young adults, you don't fit in if you're a Christian. And it makes it so hard when you can't fit into this world and you're trying to figure out who you are. That's the reason why discipleship is so important in the church for older men to disciple younger men and older women to disciple younger women because they need that value. I, uh, I had dinner with a young couple this past Thursday night, and they're getting ready to have a baby in September. I think, yeah, September the 18th. And uh, I, I, if they're watching online and, and, and you guys hear this, I'm not giving your name, but just, just bear with me. I'm having dinner with them. They've both been baptized. They're living together. She's pregnant. They're not married. And they want to become members of this church. So I'm sitting there with them and I'm building rapport with them. We're laughing and we're having a good time and we're talking about this. And I reached in my wallet and I handed them a hundred dollar bill and I said, go get your marriage license. Let's get married. And they said, that sounds like a great plan to them. They actually went Saturday morning to try to get the license, but they were only doing something else there at the courthouse, and so they couldn't get it. But they're going to go this week. They're going to get the license. We're going to get them married, and they're going to become members of this church. And we're going to throw them a baby shower because that's what we do. But can you imagine in a world where you don't fit in? And that's where they felt. And they came here. And they felt like they fit in. Number 13, something is seriously wrong with me. I am defined by my flaws. <laughs> Monty Betts will tell you there's something seriously wrong with Neil Farr. <laughs> I've known him that long that he knows there's something seriously wrong with me. All right. My value is in my looks. I need to look a certain way to be accepted. Ooh, ooh, that's hitting home, isn't it? 
It does, doesn't it? You, you may, oh no, it doesn't matter to me how I look. Every one of you in here looked in the mirror before you came. Well, I, most everybody did. Some of you I'm not sure about. <laughs> we won't point out who those are. But. but my point being is we are consumed with our looks, some of us more than others. Um, I am alone. Nobody cares. I must take care of myself. Wow. Anybody deal with that one sometimes? I know some of you do because you've come to me and you've said it. All right. Uh, I feel responsible for the feelings, problems, and behaviors of others. Woo! That's a big one. I feel responsible for the feelings, problems, and behaviors of others. Um, how many men in here are fixers? If you're a man, you're a fixer, okay? And we want to fix people, right? That's what we do. We fix things. Car's broken, we fix it. You need something done, we fix it. So a lot of times that goes beyond the norm and we try to fix people. My worth is based on my performance. I must be perfect. Oh, how I've struggled with that one. I wanted to be perfect. I... Uh, <laughs> I was talking with Joel the other day, and he was talking about somebody criticizing something that was happening, and he was trying to explain to me, you know, hey, you know, Neil, I did this right, and, and you know, I, it's not my fault, and, and they were being critical of me, and I said, well, Joel, don't worry about it. Let me just explain this to you. When you're in ministry, people throw poop on you. This just happens, and you just got to let it roll off. You just have to let it roll off. If you carry it around with you, you're going to stay away from ministry. And yes, I did say the word poop. For those of you who are looking at me, did he just say poop? <laughs> so anyway, uh, my worth is based on my performance. It must be perfect. If people knew me, they would not like me. Ooh, that's a big one. If people really knew me, they would not like me. Uh, and that's, that's what makes us put on the mask. Number 19, God doesn't love me or really care. He won't be there when I need him. He won't be there when I need him. That, that is so true for a lot of people. They just feel like God is not there. Number 20, showing my emotions is a sign of weakness. For all of, all of us men who are over the age of 50... Man, we grew up in a generation where men don't cry, and if you cried, you had something terribly wrong with you. And uh, one of the most freeing things that ever happened to me is when I, was, when I had kids, and I was able to cry freely for the joy I had and cry freely when, with the, the uh, uh, issues that I was dealing with. Uh, I let the emotions go, and it made such a difference. Number 21, the third page. People will only like me if I'm happy. And there's nothing wrong with being happy, by the way, but if you're dealing with something. <laughs> I was talking to Robert, who's up in the sound booth today. He came through and said, hey, Robert, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing fine. And uh, then he looked at me, or should I say, I'm not doing good and I'm not having a good day. <laughs> so anyway, he's listening to some of the classes. Number 22, it's my responsibility to problem solve for people. No, your responsibility is to listen to people. You can't always solve people's problems, but you can always listen. Oh, I knew it. I'm, I'm falling down. Paul's got something to say. All those other, a lot of the ones in the back there, those remind me of a rhyme when I was a little kid. Nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat. Uh, yep. Er, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms. Okay. All right. I, uh, I don't deserve to be happy. I can't change this. It's just the way I am. Oh, if there's anything that disturbs me as your preacher is when people say, I can't change. Ooh, God wouldn't call us to change if we couldn't change. God never calls us to do something he, can't, he didn't equip us to do. So don't ever say to me, I can't change, because we can all change. 
Uh, if I don't allow myself to feel, I won't, then I won't get hurt. Asking for help is a sign of weakness. Man, that's a generational thing for me. Uh, some sins are, unfor are not forgivable. I don't know how many times people have come in my office and they've been wanting to confess something going on and um, they have said something along the lines, Neil, I know you've heard a lot, but what I'm about to tell you is going to shock you. And I can tell you this in my years of preaching, I've only been shocked a few times. Most of the people that come in and they tell me what their sin is, I'm like, I've heard it all before. Uh, people need me, but I don't need them. I can handle my problems myself. I don't need help. If I tell people no, they won't like me. I got to tell you, that's my biggest struggle right there. Telling people no. And I have got to do a weekly exercise of what my priorities are so that I don't say yes to the wrong things. Um, it is best to keep peace, peace at all costs. Conflict is uh, difficult for a lot of us, so we would rather keep peace than, and, than handle a problem. Number 32, rules do not apply to me. That's one. <laughs> Jennifer's over here laughing because she knows me. There's not a day goes by that I don't look at the speed limit and see that I'm five miles over <laughs> and think, well, it's okay because I'm busy. <laughs> uh, rules don't apply to me. 33, if I want something done right, I must do it myself. Chris Kent struggles with that, don't you, Chris? <laughs> I can tell by the smile on his face. Okay. Um, people will eventually leave or betray me. I, uh, I have a dear friend, and uh, we were really good friends with them, and, and we were, Nancy and I were moving away, and uh, she just got angry at us. I mean, I got a promotion with my job, and we were moving to another city. It wasn't that far away, but we were moving to another city, city and she just, you know, she'd been through some issues when she was younger, and she just came right out and said that she was mad at us because we were leaving her. I'm like, what? What do you mean we're leaving you? So it was like, but that's just part of her background. Uh, number 35, I don't measure up. I am a failure. So you should have starred all the ones that you are dealing with, and then you should go and find the scriptures. I could have written down scriptures for each one of them, but there is something very uh, therapeutic when you write down the scriptures yourself. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry to go over. Love you guys. Appreciate you being here.